Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly podcast. We've got an interview with Ben Duckett to kick off today's show. We'll also try to work out what the SA20 means for world cricket, if anything at all. We've got some World Cup squad announcements, a bunch of ODIs to talk about as we get ever closer to the 50 over World Cup in India later this year. I'm Yaz Rana and with me today is Ben Gardner and Joe Harmon. Long-time listeners of the show will remember that about a year ago, we got Ben Duckett on to talk about his winter and his aspirations for 2022. At the time, he played just once for England in the previous six years and was very much on the outside of that England setup. A lot has changed for Duckett in the past 12 months. So here he is on his breakout 2022. Great to have you on, Ben. I think it's pretty much a year since we last spoke and obviously a lot's changed since then. Um, we're 11 days into the new year. Um, how do you look back on 2022 where quite a lot of cool things happened to you? Yeah, it has. Um, I don't know, really. It's it's something that's probably I've been working towards for three or four years now. And I think to get the rewards for all the hard work I've I've put in, you know, with knots and I guess the scores I've got is, is really nice. Um, yeah, it's probably, it probably is the best year I've had so far. So... Um, yeah, fingers crossed I can keep that going. Mm. Um, what what was it like getting that call up at the end of the South Africa Test Series? The Test team were the talk of the town all summer. What was it like coming into that environment with Stokes and McCullum? Yeah, um, yeah, it was it was obviously amazing to get that call. Um, I actually I wasn't around too much for that oval test. I was there for the first day and then. And then I actually left just because I was going to Pakistan the next week. So I was just having some time, kind of time to chill and be away from cricket. Um, but yeah, I mean, kind of the way that I play my cricket is, you know, based around how, how they do. And certainly this summer, I I um, I went even more like how I used to play. And that was purely because I was watching, you know, the Test Boys and not necessarily... I didn't change the way I was playing because I wanted to get a call up. I just, you know, I just thought, I think there was a, a, a period of a few years, you know, Red Bull cricket, how you you should play the game. And, you know, at the top of the order, you need to leave the ball well and bat for long periods of time doing that. And actually realised in my head, watching those guys that, you know, you don't have to play like that. Um, that's certainly... You know, whenever I've scored runs, it's not by doing that. It's by being aggressive and scoring runs. So, yeah, I mean, to to be involved in, in this team right now is, is an extremely special time. And I, I think it's probably, if I was ever to play in an era of test cricket, it, it would be this one. Mm. And what was it like when you went to Pakistan with a test squad? Um, obviously, you went on a tour of Asia when you were 21. How different was it coming into that dressing room uh, at, at your age, 28, compared to when you were 21 back in back in 2016? And, and how different were you as well, as a, um, obviously a lot more experienced now? Yeah, I can't really compare because, you know, one side is a 20-year-old 20, 20 kid and the other one's a 28-year-old who's played a lot of cricket. So, um, to be honest, the, the environment in the dressing room when I played back then was, was fairly similar. Um, Certainly with the players, I, I think there was maybe more pressure on you to perform, you know, back then. Well, there definitely was. Um, and I think it was more based on, you know, if you don't score runs, media are all over you, you're going to be out of the team. And it's kind of, it picks itself. Whereas this time, it was very different in the sense of, you know, this is our team led by McCullum Stokes. And we picked you because we believe you're good enough and we believe you can score runs at this level. And if you don't, don't worry about it. Like you're going to get, you're going to get your chances. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing for me. And I think, you know, as a top order batsman, you need that backing and you almost need to go into it, you know, playing for England, not fearing that you're going to get dropped a game later. Um, and I've actually used this word a few times, but, I feel like at the top of the order in English cricket over the last 10 years, it's been a conveyor belt and it's just been, you have a couple of games onto the next person, onto the next person. And I don't think looking back at the, the names who have played for England, I don't think they weren't good enough. I just, 
I think you need time to to settle into that environment and and um and yeah, I, I think that was the biggest thing for me. And I mean to to start the series like I did, you know, kind of not that I, I had any pressure from, you know, anyone in the dressing room, but the pressure you have in your own self of can I do it at this level? Um yeah, I think to get a hundred in the first innings just took all of that away from me and kind of takes pressure off even this next series coming up because I know I've had such a great series there and you know I'm not fighting it I'm not chasing it looking for a big score or looking for that first hundred in New Zealand or or moving forward because you know I've already got there which is quite nice Mm. what was that moment like when you got to your your first test ton it was a really weird moment because I'm sure you'll know like we were all in in bed for two days leading up to it and yeah yeah, that's probably the worst I'll feel on a cricket pitch, um, certainly playing for England. And yeah, I mean, I just tried to focus and give it absolutely everything. Um, you know, really looking back, I, I probably thrown away the easiest double hundred going, you know, on a on a flat pitch and against against the attack in those conditions. Um, but all all I remember is getting to a hundred and you know, all my energy and emotions had just, you know, gone through the roof and as soon as I got to that moment, I just kind of decided I'm just going to try and hit every ball for four after this because I just had nothing left in me, um, purely because I was just feeling ill and, and the two days before. So not quite how I, I imagined my first Test 100, but um, yeah, I was just buzzing to get there. Um, so how close were you to not playing then? Oh, so close. Um, the day before, we were pretty much trying to push the Test match back a day. Um, luckily for me, we there was ten of us, ten of us ill, maybe more. Um, and then the doctor came round and knocked on all of our doors at seven seven a.m. the morning of the test match, basically saying, "Are you all right to play?" And to be honest, when I woke up, I wasn't I wasn't feeling great. And I mean, she, Anita, our our doctor, um, basically said quite a few of the lads have said they're up for it. Stokes, he put a message on the group saying, "Let's go and get them." So just from then, it was like. All right, we'll get out there and get on with it. Um, so yeah, I, I knew that a lot of the players were ill. I didn't know that you were one of them. Um, so what what was said uh, just before you went out there? Because you didn't just go out and score your first Test hundred. That was a record a record breaking all time record breaking day of Test cricket. What was said? Was it just go out there and play your natural game, or was it let's go at sixes? What kind of chat was there before you went out? If I'm totally honest, there was zero chat. Not one word was said. Um, we obviously won the toss, and I think more more importantly, everyone was buzzing because I think all of our bowlers were ill, so I think they wanted an extra day off. So, yeah, we just we just went out there and saw the ball, and you know it's a belting pitch to bat on. So, um, yeah, honestly, nothing throughout the whole day, um, and throughout the whole series, we didn't really. You know, if we were batting or you know. Not a lot was said. If we were bowling, there might be a few discussions about how we go about it. Um, but in general, you know, even going into that last innings of of the chase, not one word was said before we went out either. You know, mm. I think that's a great place to be that you can go out and play with that freedom and you're not even told to. Where do you think that freedom comes from? Because no one has ever played like England did across those three test matches. Well, I mean... I think they, I mean, they they played like that throughout the whole of last summer, didn't they? You know, against good seam attacks in, at times, tricky conditions. Um, so, it, for me, it's pretty obvious where it's come from. I mean, Baz has come in as coach and Stokes, he leads by example in that sense, you know, as captain. So, as I've only had a small taste of it, but for me, the biggest change has been since those two kind of took over. Mm. Um and I mean, just listening to hear you speak about that, do you think we sometimes just overthink cricket? Like, actually, sometimes it's quite a lot more simple than we, we try to make it out to be. Yeah, I think so. And I think maybe test cricket was portrayed in a way where you, you, were, you were told how you had to play it. And I think that's why it's so interesting now, you know, the way we're going about it and stuff. And I can think of numerous times in my career where I've faced a 74 mile an hour bowler on a green seamer and I've just scratched around and got 20 off 50. And if that was next summer, I'm probably, you know, slog sweeping him into the short side or, or whatever it may be. And it's just, 
I think if you go out with the mindset of of that, I mean, there's there's no ceiling. I think England have showed how far you can take the game in white ball cricket. Um, and I think you know, just because the ball is a different colour doesn't mean you can you can't do that in red ball. I'm. I think there's certain times where you're going to have to respect the game and respect the conditions and respect good bowling. But um, it's actually amazing what you can do when you put your mind to to go out and being positive. Mm. Um, what's the prep like between games? Because I saw England put out a few videos on the Instagram account of you guys just having a six hitting competition on the eve of the game. Um, is is it just like a very fun environment to be around in between test matches? Obviously, in Pakistan, it's a very specific environment where you're spending a lot of time in hotels. And the, and it was a very you know compact series. It was basically three tests in three weeks. So yeah, what what was it like being in and around the camp? Um, yeah, it'd be like it'd be like day off golf, and then train. Um, yeah, the six hitting thing was a load of fun. I think led by Stokesy and Baz. Um, you know, I, it's probably important to say we did train after that, but it was a nice way to start training. Um, but yeah, I mean that would never ever have happened in the history of test cricket before but you know before a last test match and to be honest i think if we were if it was one all going into that we'd have done the same thing um yeah i think it was just to free everyone up just have a bit of a laugh um but yeah i mean we i think it's important when you're playing five day test matches to get away from it and you know most of the squad plays golf and and that's one way of switching off um and you know fight you 15 days days of cricket sorry um you know, in the space of a, a short amount of time, you know, those valuable days off in between tests are just as important as going to have a 30 minute net session. Mm. And on the field, obviously the, the pitch at particularly at Royal Pindy was very flat. And uh, one of the, one of the hallmarks of Stokes's captaincy so far is that England take 20 wickets every single time you go out on the field. And those are some of the hardest conditions to take. 20 wickets. So what was it like being out there on the field with Stokes as captain, kind of, uh, you know, manoeuvring, uh, the mixing up the bowling attack in the way that he did? He did some things that you'd not really seen that much before. When T's got out to Asia, he was very clever with his use of the seamers. Um, so, yeah, what was it like seeing Stokes at work on the field? Yeah, there's <clears throat> there's, there's, there's not many dull moments, that's for sure. And, and that's during a five-day test match is on one of the flattest pitches you know, ever to be played on. Um, and the only reason why we got 20 wickets on that specific pitch was because of the, you know, field Stokes he set, you know, keeping everyone in the game throughout the whole time. Um, you could very easily have one slip, a deep point, deep square, you know, a ring field, and it'd just be dull to watch. Um, you know, I think at times Pakistan set fields like that to us. And on a flat pitch, it's so easy to just keep scoring at a, at a low risk. Um, when you've got these funky fields and people all around you, it's as a batsman, it's a nightmare because you know you're, they're in your vision. You don't really know if you want to hit the ball in front of you. Um, and and yeah, I actually looking back, I think that was the most incredible thing to take twenty wickets on that pitch. Um, you know, really with no one who could bowl above eighty five mile an hour, um, which shows the skill of the bowling and and those guys even in those conditions um, and without you know, mystery spin, you know, I think it was a ridiculous effort. Um, but yeah, it's, it makes things so much better in the field when, when those things are going on and you're in different fielding positions all the time and, and you, you got catches around the bat. It's, it's far more fun. Hmm. Um, and just, just on the timing of, of your return, do you think that you came back to international cricket at, at the right time? I know you played a bit in 2019, but do you think you benefited from coming back a bit later when you've just got that extra cricket under your belt and you're more sure about your game? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, even two years ago, I wasn't, you know, wasn't really set in my game. I think it's only been the last 18 months really where I've just found something that's clicked. And and especially in red ball, I think white ball, I've been, I've been pretty consistent for quite a few years now. Um, but yeah, I, I, it was, it was the first time I'd put an England shirt on in the T20 series and the test series, feeling like I was, properly ready to go and score runs at this level um and yeah i say earlier that's due to the you know the work i've put in with my coaches here at knots over the last few years um so yeah so yeah i mean especially red ball i feel like last year was the most consistent i was throughout the whole summer um 
and yeah and it was it was nice to go and go and play in Pakistan and go and play to my strengths as opposed to you know trying something different mm. um I've got to ask about your sweeping in that T20i series in particular um how did that develop because that's not something that is typically associated with English players and I'm, I'm not sure anyone has ever had so many sweeps in their locker and used them so much as you did across actually the T20 and the test series to be honest yeah um again it's it's like about knowing my game and boundaries were generally quite short there um so you know i knew i was going to use the sweep but even the day before the first t20 i'd have had no idea i was going to play that many um you know i some, sometimes surprise myself with different options and areas i can hit the ball but certainly in the last couple of years you know the hundred in the blast it's been a strength of mine and i think i found you know so many different options now with the reverse and the sweep one shot I didn't really play before was the paddle too much, but bringing that one in, you know, means spinners have to bowl slower to me, which actually makes the normal sweep shot a lot easier. Um, but yeah, I've kind of realized that, you know, my game isn't hitting the bowler generally back into the side screen or over his head and taking on cow corner. If I've, I've tried to find a game that is quite low risk for me and I can still score at a decent rate. Um, and yeah, I just, Obviously, the two spinners I faced in that series spun it into me, which I find a lot easier. Um, and yeah, with, with the small boundaries, it felt like I kind of could play a sweep or a reverse every ball and, you know, at low risk. And it was either, you know, one, two or four. Mm. Um, obviously, you, you did really well in both the T20s then the tests and you got an ODI series coming up. I remember you, last year when we spoke, you talked about how you try and keep things relatively similar across formats. Is that is that still the case? Is that is that basically the way you see batters having to survive when you've got to switch between formats so often these days? Yeah, I guess I can only speak for myself, but really, actually, I kind of play 50 over cricket how I play test match cricket or four-day cricket. It's, you know, sea ball, hit ball kind of mentality. Um, you know, with, I would have normally said, you know, with playing the odd more risk with a scoop and stuff, but who knows? I might, I might play one of those in the test series coming up now with with, with this mindset of the England have got. Um, but yeah, so for for me, that you know, the core of my game and and everything is very similar throughout all three to to pace and seam really. So I don't really mind too much, you know, going from series to series. I I actually find, you know, if I go and score runs in South Africa, I'll always already be ahead going into New Zealand because you know, runs under your belt and, and just feeling good. Mm. There's a lot of chat, um, I guess, towards the end of the England summer about the high performance review. Um, I, mem- I remember last year you were talking about um, because of the pitches at Trent Bridge have been reasonably bowler friendly in the past. You've, you've actually, as a, as a batting group, um, kind of batted quite positively to, to kind of get results on those, on those pitches. So what, what do you make of all that chat around pitches and how much cricket there is, et cetera, um, at the moment? Um, well, it's probably not for me to answer, is it? I mean, that's just for every county and, and what they want to do with their pitches. Um, yeah, you're right. When, you know, Trent Bridge is, is, can be quite tricky at times, definitely first innings. And we kind of decide, decided really as a group, we're going to be positive and, and try and score as quick as we can because we're going to get bowled out. I mean, you know, we'd rather get bowled out scoring 50, 60 more runs than we would. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to see what happens moving forward in county cricket. You know, things, you know, counties can be, you know, play the game however they want. And, you know, some people are going to keep doing what they what, what they want to do. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what, what happens in, you know, in cricket and pitches and, and if sides are starting to play more like the England team or if they, you know, just stick to how they want to play. Mm. Um, and then finally, at the start of the new year, what are your hopes for 2023? Do you, do you sit down and kind of pinpoint targets or is it you just kind of take every series, every competition um, as it comes? No, there's, you know, there's, I wouldn't necessarily, I, well, I never set targets. I mean, this, this, this year, I mean, I'd love to be sitting here this time next year and I'm still, you know, wearing an England shirt in, in all three formats. Um certainly one or two of them at least um you know and at the end of the day if i'm going to be doing that then i'll have i'll have had a good year and scored quite a few runs so yeah i, I wouldn't set 
you know, I, I wouldn't put a ceiling on anything, but it would be nice to, you know, I'd love to, you know, score runs in an Ashes, you know, win, win an Ashes series and, and contribute to that. Um, I, I mean, that would just be incredible if you'd have told me 12 months ago I was going to be, you know, there or thereabouts for an Ashes series in the summer. I I, I certainly wouldn't have believed you. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's an exciting summer with, you know, obviously you've got all my stuff at Knots. We're back in Div 1 this year. So, you know, depending on how much cricket I play for them, I'm not sure at this at this moment in time, but, you know, the games I am there, I, I want to, you know, get a couple of wins under our belts for, for, for the team. Um, you know, wh whatever happens in the 100 as well, it's it's always an exciting, exciting comps play. And, um, and there's so much cricket for England, I think, this summer. You know, there's, I think there's white ball stuff at the back end and uh, 50 over World Cup in October. I mean... Yeah, the the two big ones are, are probably those, and you know, to represent your country in a World Cup would be would be would be amazing. Mm, awesome! Thanks a lot for your time, Ben, and I hope you uh, get on the golf course soon and have a have a great couple of tours to Africa, New Zealand. Thank you, mate. Joe, you spoke to Duckett before he went out to Pakistan, so you've heard a lot from him recently. So, what did you make of that interview? Yeah, it's a good interview. He he always gives a bit more than it feels like you're getting. He's quite understated, not hugely expressive, but he's quite honest. And I found that when I've spoken to him in the past as well. I spoke to him a few weeks before he went out to India in 2016. So Bangladesh and India in 2016 for his debut. He just scored about 2,000 runs in a season for North Ants. He'd won the PCA Young Player and Player of the Year award. And uh, he was clearly riding high. And I think... He might admit himself he was probably a bit complacent about what test cricket might demand of him at that point. And he got a 50 in Bangladesh, but then went to India and got Ashwin, basically. Just found it very difficult, as a lot of left-handers do against Ravi Ashwin. Um, there's no shame in that, but I think he was probably relying on his talent at that point and didn't have the kind of now around his game that he's developed since. Then I spoke to him just before he went out to Pakistan, and he was... Oh, again, very confident. And he talked about if I'm facing spin, my, my sweep is basically my forward defence. And I was like, oh. there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance. And it's yeah. basically decided by how well you go. Uh, and he's gone so well. And that, that now looks like a great line. But I did slightly fear for him going out there, um, despite the fact that I think he's a, he's a really good player. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm delighted it's gone so well for him. And I think there was a sense that he was maybe a kind of horses for courses selection because he's so good against spin. Um, but he's definitely done enough to earn a spot that's shown that he can be an opener for for all seasons. A couple of things that jumped out for me in that interview, he, he referred to this England team as our team and Ollie Pope said exactly the same to me. There's a clear sense that the players have ownership of this team in a way that they didn't feel they had before. It's almost like a kind of county or even a club, the way they talk about it. Um, which, you know, when it's going great is fantastic. When it goes wrong, people might st will probably start to say it's a bit cliquey, but you know, hopefully we don't get to that stage too soon. Um, but he's a, he's a cricket who's had to bide his time. And as he said, said himself there, that's probably been no bad thing for him. He, he's really learned his game. He knows what works and what doesn't. Uh, and hopefully he's set for, a you know, a, a real good stint for England across all formats or certainly the test format for a while. I liked uh, what he said about um, before that first day and that first morning in, in Raul Pindley when... Uh, they obviously went out and broke basically every record there's ever been on, on day one of a test match. And at the end of the game, we were sort of praising Ben Stokes and Brent McCann's sort of strategic genius <laughs> yeah. for uh, this plan they'd put into place. That, yeah, they, they knew they had to score so quickly to get uh, all those runs and then uh, take 20 wickets. And then he goes, so, so what What was said to you? What was the plan? He's like, didn't say anything at all. Which, you know, from one from one point of view is like, uh, what, what even is this new thing? But I think it actually shows how deep-rooted this new way of playing is is that actually and it's you can think of probably Ben Stokes being like this, this brave heart type leader delivering you know these these impassioned speeches and telling people to you know to to go out and be themselves and to do it for for, for king and country and whatever um when actually it's it's the, the 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 time when they choose to speak it seems is what's making the big difference and almost maybe everything they've needed to be said was said basically before on on T on that fifth day at Trent Bridge basically that was the thing and as soon as that happened and that worked you almost don't need to say it again because you've already said everything you need to say essentially um but yeah and and it's interesting that they so say there was a, a piece this week I think by Tim Wigmore on the Telegraph about how they had a chat with the counties basically saying like we would like you to play like we do not a demand although 
when Brendan McCullum and Ben Stokes say we would like you to do something. You do it, don't I'm sure you? that's quite hard to turn down. Yeah. Uh, but it's interesting that even that needs to be said because Duckett was saying in that chat that he wasn't even doing it to get picked for England. He just saw it and was like, that kind of looks like fun. That looks like it would suit me. So I'm going to do that as well. And it worked for him. And you'd think counties might do that naturally or at least some players will do that naturally, I guess. Sam Northeast said the same when we spoke to him last summer before he went and scored a 400 as well that it wasn't necessarily driven by getting back into the England team. It's just like, well, why don't I play like that? It looks so, you know, simple and fun. It's the way everyone wants to play cricket and then sort of forgets about as they get mm. further along in their career. But yeah, it is, you know, when we sit here, it's slightly disconcerting when we sit here and analyse these matches and talk about the genius involved. And then D Ben Duckett says, zero chat, not a word <laughs> was said. <We're> like, oh. <laughs> There is definitely something in keeping it simple, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the thing that I was probably most struck by was was hearing just how ill he was before he scored his first Test 100. And I liked what he said about, like, he basically thought I had a, there was a double 100 there for the taking, which, again, demonstrates his confidence. He's not scored a Test 100 yet. He's disappointed he didn't score a double. I wondered, you know, when he said he was about 10th in line, by that point, everyone had said yes. I wondered if Ben Folkes was the first in line because he was the only one who didn't. He was like, <laughs> oh, well, I don't think any of us are going to play. So, like, yeah, I'm not feeling too good. <laughs> yeah. Then everyone after says, yeah, I'm up for it. Why yeah. not? And also, Ben, you said there's no ben, there weren't as many Ben Stokes Braveheart speeches as, as you, you might have hoped for. But there was that WhatsApp message that he sent out that let's go get him when everyone was in, in, in bed. That's a very modern <laughs> Braveheart message, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? A, what, a WhatsApp message. Maybe it was a voice note. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have a new T20 league and there's another one that gets underway soon as well. The SA20 started on Tuesday in South Africa it, with uh, the their equivalent of the El Clasico, Paul Royals versus MI Cape Town. Plenty of high-profile English representation, including Joffre Archer making his first competitive appearance since July 2021. He took three for 27 from his four overs and looked very good. Ben, before we get on to the SA20 as a whole, it was just great to have him back. Oh, yeah, it was so good. Um, and obviously, you know, it's been it's been so long. And actually, even obviously people talk about how long it's been since his last game. It's been longer than that, really. He's had this struggle with injuries going back to, to early 2020, really, when he first had that elbow stress fracture. And, you know, obviously, we hope that this is the one that sticks, basically. Uh, but I think the main thing that I took from this was that, you know, even if this is, you know, for, for one tournament or, you know, for a few months or for years until, you know, that, that we get Joffre Archer sort of without any uh, any any of those kind of worries it's just good to like enjoy him when you have him because this was it, it was brilliant um, and there was all the teasing in between I don't know if you saw the the slow-mo vid that um uh that MI Cape Town put up of him like running in with the cap on backwards and the and the chain bouncing and he's I think he's uh I think he's put on some muscle I think since that time and he was he's quite sort of slight and willowy and now it looks like he's got the like the, the shoulders are broad the, the the biceps are really sort of like bulging out which um uh, which was notable for, from that thing. And then, so yeah, so they, then MI win the toss and choose to bowl. And so you're excited about Joff Arch taking the new ball. And then uh, Rashid Khan throws the ball to George Linder, who obviously, very good bowler, getting through an over of spin, first over T20 is a, is, a, is, is a common tactic, so that's fine. But I think quite a lot of people wanted to see Joff Arch just steaming in. And then Sam Karin takes a second over and it's like, when is this going to happen? And then the third over comes and it is, yeah, it's everything that you kind of have remembered Archer being especially that that first ball was just the absolutely typical Joffre Archer mm. T20 new ball ball the one that's like sort of that hard short of a length there's some seam movement there's kind of more bounce that you're expecting from that kind of smooth action and uh and yeah we had Lubber the opener just didn't really have a hope and then tried to play a big shot hit it up in the air Jason Roy comes in uh and is, is, is leaving it and this is Roy who is you know the most attacking of all of England's super attacking white ball players is, is giving respect to Joffre Archer in that first over. Um, so yeah, Got that was brilliant. 90 mph as well. Yeah, yeah. He was still there. bowling really quick. And, and yeah, the, the, he also bowled the 19th over, which I think went for two runs and took another and took two wickets. Mm. And there was a, a, a really, really lovely slur ball in there as well, um, which uh, I can't remember who it was, but the, the, the batter was uh, was miles early on it. And mm. uh, yeah, it was just great to see him back. Yeah, I was just saying, it's, it's, it's hugely exciting to see him again. You kind of almost forget how good he was or is. Um, when I came into the office uh, just afterwards, uh, our colleague Toby, who does the commercial side of things here, was visibly excited about the SAT20 opener, which I wasn't <laughs> expecting, I have to say. And that was all because of Joffre Archer. And he, and he said, quite rightly, there's no one else like him. And, mm. and, and there isn't. And his immediate question was, do you reckon he'll play in the Ashes? Because that's obviously where our, mm. our, where our minds are wandering at this stage. Uh, and, you know, Ben Stokes tweeting, buzzing, buzzing, buzzing to see him back. Sure, part of that will be because he knows mm. what, 
Joffre has been through and he'll be pleased to see his teammate playing again. But also that's Ben Stokes, England test captain, talking. He wants Joffre Archer as part of his Ashes squad. And, you know, he's not going to play five tests this summer. No chance. But Mark Wood probably won't either. Imagine if you can kind of dovetail those two express quicks at their best, if we can get to that point and keep them both fit. Several ifs in there, but it would be hugely exciting. And Ollie Stone as well, who's who's a of teammate yeah. of Archer in in the SA twenty. He was he was really quick. I thought he looked very good as well. Um, I quite liked. I think we were only two games into the competition, and I think it was a very good choice to have that game first because I think those are the two best teams. I think people's impressions of the tournament. I think the tournament looks really good, but I think will be slightly higher than it probably will be in a week time because that was the opening game. Um, and there was, I think, it was a missed opportunity to not have Archer bowling to Butler as the first ball of the competition instead of having George Linder to Van Luver. Yeah, um, I saw they, um, MI Cape Town did one of those kind of dressing room videos afterwards and it was Archer um, being sort of congratulated on coming back and he gave a little speech and he was like, I hope by the end of this tournament we're, we're a, we feel like a proper team and we know when each other bowl and when each other bat. And I thought maybe that was a message to Rashid Khan. Like, you, you give me the new ball, right? You give me yeah. the new ball. Um, Alec asks, I know it's completely unrealistic and it will never happen, especially in the modern full throttle era. But having just watched Joffre Archer dive arse over tits for a ball at mid-off and take what seemed like an eternity to an England fan at least, to get back to his feet, it was probably about 10 seconds after having 17 months out, do you think there's a case for certain players to well just take it a bit steady in the field? I think there's every time that Root or Anderson dies full length into the advertising hoardings uh, to save one run. I often think, just leave it, Jimmy. Let them take that one run. And we'll keep you on the park and you'll take 30 more wickets this year. Surely some resources are just a bit too precious. As I say, I know it will never happen and I might still emotionally be scarred from Simon Jones at Brisbane back in 2002. But I did wince when Archer went down and stayed down. Um, oh, it's, ben, it's Ben Stokes for me. It's just like, <laughs> leave it, Ben, honestly. Yeah, we know you really care and you try hard, but just leave it. But it's quite an interesting question because the idea would be that you'd you'd be labelled indispensable so you can't dive, but other people would be like, yeah, you go for it. <laughs> we're, we're not too fussed about you, so you, you throw yourself into yeah. the hoardings and see how you get on. Um, we had quite a few questions on the SA20. It's obviously piqued a lot of people's interest. So Philip asked, how many T20 competitions is too many? Uh, and Patrick asked, this week feels rather poignant as the first real shift in fans now starting to follow the players rather than the teams in these T20 leagues. Everyone knows Archer bowled a maiden in his first over, but does anyone know or care who he bowled for or against? Um, ben, you've watched um, most of the first two games, not all of them. What, what have you made of the competition so far and 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 is it is it a bad thing is it a good thing well it's definitely i mean as ever these things always have good good sides and bad sides it's, it's interesting what he says about the lack of identity because i think there's a concerted effort actually by some of these indian team owners to create an identity uh, across these leagues so with Joffre archer the team he was playing for was mi cape town which is the mumbai indians owned team in the staff league and the same with Paul Royals were owned by Bradstrom Royals and had uh, Joss Butler um, opening the batting, you know. So, so there is there is an effort to create a bit of an identity across these teams. Um, and you had, you know, Javel Brevis in that in the MI Cape Town team as well, who obviously was in a way unearthed by Mumbai Indians uh, last year. Um, but then that that is itself odd. You do feel a bit like you're watching sort of like a, a an Indian Premier League spin-off because, I mean, I guess that's almost what it, what it is. But it is also just like really fun. I mean, I feel like it's weird actually you don't almost don't see too much T20 cricket played in South Africa. I mean, they've struggled to create this kind of profile of league for a long time and it just they, they haven't hosted a T20 World Cup in, in a while. And you'd think it should be perfect for it to have, you know, its own spin on it. You know, you think you've got like really hard, fast tracks. And the first game wasn't like that. But if you, if you, what, what you think of it in your mind as is, you know, hard, fast tracks, thin air, so the ball travels miles. Small boundaries. Uh, yeah, fa- fast bowlers. This endless production line of sort of, big burly East Africans who can hit it and who can who can bowl it quickly that sounds like just from the raw materials as a very like attractive t20 package and i think that will play out i mean we've seen already new players start to announce themselves like what donovan ferreira who i know he's people amazing are, pe- people have been excited about him but this is this is the kind of platform that will you know will, will get him deals and 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 fans around the world um so like i think it can be it, it's it's weird i think although the the identity is clearly there is an identity that is attached to the Indian Premier League. I think it will be able to form its own identity as something that appeals to fans globally. Uh, hopefully, this is something that enables South African cricket to keep going as uh, you know as a going concern, basically, and to um, uh, and to fund 
you know, the the other stuff that we like about South African cricket, that, you know, to have those teams competing in, in, in test cricket and being threats at, at world events. Um, and it can be its own entertainment package. So at, th- at the moment, I think I'm broadly in favour of it while also recognising that there are some oddities to it with that IPL influence, I guess. From a very kind of English-centric perspective, I think it's got quite a bit going for it in the time it falls. You know, the mm. IPL, there's always that, you know, I know a lot of people in this country love the IPL, but there is also a lot of people who don't like it because it eats into the county season. And you've got this kind of conflict where the English season starts, but the attention is elsewhere. A lot of the best players are elsewhere. Whereas this league is arriving at a time when there's not a huge amount else going on. Um, minds are starting to wander to cricket if you're thinking about the new season. So it's almost kind of like a gateway into it. Um, you know, South Africa is a fantastic place to, play, place to play cricket. So a lot of English players are going to be involved. So I think from a purely English, English perspective, I think there's going to be a reasonable amount of interest in it. Mm. Um, yeah, I was trying to think what, what I think about it. I, I was trying to compare it to a lot of bilateral cricket where it's played in front of um, not particularly packed houses. And this only two games in, but they've got big crowds in. And also, I think for me, the looking at how much people are being pay, being paid, I think... I remember when the 100 started, a lot of people made the point, it's great that someone like Tom Abel doesn't have to play for England to earn a lot of money on top of his county deal. Um, Tristan Stubbs is being paid uh, about half a million pounds for this one month tournament, which is also, by the way, about four times what the best paid player in the 100 gets. So I think competitions like this will have consequences for the 100. And we already saw, we talked about it before we started recording, that we already saw in 2022 that the men's 100 was already struggling to attract and attract and keep the best players for the entire competition. And that competition like this will make that even harder for the 100. But I think it is a good thing that South Africa are able to pay their really talented players a lot of money early on. I mean, South Africa for years has had like talent drain, really, really good players seeking a living elsewhere because unless you're playing for the South Africa team, it's really hard to, to maintain a living in South Africa. So I think that is definitely a good thing. Um, what it means, I mean, I, I, I'm not that fussed if bilateral cricket declines and you get, and it's replaced with cricket with full houses like this, that's fine for me. It's more, we've talked about... Bilateral before. white ball cricket. White ball cricket, sorry, yeah. Bilateral white ball cricket. That's so this is the, Yeah, that is an important... Um, thing thing to state because I worry about test cricket and but I'm not sure if this does this accelerate the decline in test cricket I don't know I don't really know um, it's certainly another thing to squeeze into the calendar uh, it's another thing for players to see where they can earn a lot of money if you're a fast bowler as we've talked about on the show previously and you can earn that money playing in South Africa and you don't earn that much playing test cricket for South Africa, what are you going to decide to do? And that's so that you're, the question you asked at the top, is this important? Well, even if you don't care about it, even if you don't watch a single ball of this tournament, if you care about test cricket, it is by extension an important development, mm. just like the other ILT20. Is that what it's called? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, and just from, a, from a, a kind of basic point of view in terms of what South Africa's home season looks like, I mean, we talk about it here when you have the 100 and they're trying to, they have that window for it. And that, I mean, it squeezes international cricket to other pints but at least our season is quite long so you can uh you can have the season earlier and later in South Africa this this might well just cut into when they can host test cricket so it might be that those you know mm. what well, we've already seen that those three test series would have played have become two test series and I guess this is part of the reasons they want to fit in this mm. other thing it is interesting on the, on the caliber of players because not only are the caliber of overseas players probably a cut above the 100 but <laughs> actually the caliber of English players is a cut above the 100 as well I think you would have seen it game in the 100 with the caliber of English talent as in that first game in uh, in the SA20 with what Butler, Roy, Archer, I mean, and Butch. Morgan, yeah, Stone. Exactly. But Butch predicted it actually, uh, and we did see it earlier this year, or sorry, in last year when uh, English players, like the, 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 the top name England players, especially the multi-format ones, do actually see that sort of, that gap in the 100 where they're supposed to be playing as almost an opportunity for rest basically and uh and so it is it's an odd situation where you have like guys like like but butler just doesn't play much hundred and does play lots of franchise t20 stuff elsewhere and yet he's supposed to be like you'd think the hundred he would be one of the draw cards and yet he is a draw card for other competitions which is odd i guess mm. and also the pay thing it, it, it test cricket international cricket has not been able to to create a model 
where players like Donovan Ferreira get paid a lot of money. That's been a problem for ages, and that's an international cricket has never really been able to solve it. So that's definitely a good thing. But yeah, I don't, I don't know what I think about what this means for, for, for Test cricket in South Africa, but that was already on the decline before this tournament came in. So I, I don't know. It's more good cricket um, at the very least. Um, kind of linked to that, Joe, what is your moment of the week? Yeah, it is linked to that. I was hoping it was going to come to that because they, they do kind of tie in together um, sort of quite nicely. Um, so the, my moment uh, was yesterday reading an interview by Mel Farrell, um, the Australian broadcaster and writer, uh, which is going in the next issue of Wisdom Cricket Monthly, which we sent to print yesterday. Um, I, most of our listeners probably know who Mel is, but if they don't, she's worked for Crick Info for many years and she's now gone freelance. We got her in the magazine a few months ago. She's already interviewed uh, Faf C and Matthew Mott for us, both great interviews, and she's gone up another notch this month by getting Ricky Ponting for us. Uh, it's a great interview. She spoke to him during the Sydney test uh, against South Africa at the end of an Aussie summer, which is, I think it's fair to say, has kind of failed to capture the imagination. Very one-sided test series, a one-day series against England that no one turned up to. They um, bummed out in their own T20 World Cup. There's kind of the sense that a lot of the Aussie public aren't necessarily behind Pat Cummins and his team, despite how well they're doing. Um, it's hard to get a gauge on that from here, but, but Adam Collins has written similar stuff in columns for us in the magazine as well. But Ponting, the... the, the key point there's loads in there and yeah i'd urge you to read it when it comes out so i won't give away too much but the stuff he talked about related to the south africa series uh i thought was the most kind of pertinent um as a direct quote uh so he ponting said he'd never he'd never had genuine fears for the future of test cricket before but watching australia south africa he did for the first time uh, and his quote was i've never been worried about test cricket until i've seen seen this team here at south africa Absolutely. People have been pointing fingers at T20 cricket, but every country is playing T20 cricket. It's not just one or two that are playing. I mean, England play more than anyone else and look at the test cricket they're playing at the moment. So it can obviously have a really good positive effect on test cricket as well. The West Indies, who toured before South Africa and Australia, you can trace that back 20 or 30 years. You can understand their demise, but it's harder for me to understand South Africa being this. If that is the best group of players that they've got, then I think it's an issue for the world game for sure. So strong stuff from Ponting there. He goes on to say he thinks the ICC needs to find a way to fund test series which don't feature the big three. Uh, and again, I quote, because these guys right now, the West Indies and South Africa, probably need the money more than ever. Um, strong stuff. When you hear someone like Ricky Ponting suddenly saying he's got fears for the future of test cricket, it makes you sit up. It makes you worry. Uh, most of us already have these fears, but it's, mm. it's kind of poignant that sitting there at Sydney watching that game unfold. In fairness, that was a draw because it rained, but South Africa got kind of thumped in the first two was a trigger for Ponting to think well how long is this thing going to last and I think he doesn't specify I think he's talking about outside the the, the big three in inverted mm. commas um so yeah genuinely concerning stuff uh interesting thoughts on baseball too uh he says it's probably not that different to what we did uh <laughs> kind of casually out the side of the mouth but he's clearly excited by what England are doing uh and he looks ahead to the ashes a bit full of praise for Duckett for Brooke even for Ben's man Crawley, uh, and says too many of the England players who visited Australia for the Ashes just, again, I quote, made cricket look too hard. Uh, he name checks Hamid, Burns, and Sibley, which I thought was a bit unfair because he wasn't even there. But, <laughs> but I think we, I think I understand the point he's making. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a bit more about what's in the magazine next week, just yeah. as it comes out. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a great one from Ponting, who just, you know, it's so nice when he's, he just loves the game so much. It's it's mm. like an interview with a really, really knowledgeable fan who just has so much passion for it. And it's not all doom and gloom at all. There's lots of positive stuff in there as well. There's an amazing uh, video from the Big Bash this week where they put out a clip uh, of Ponting in the first week of the competition where he basically said that bowlers acclimatise to T20 competitions much, much quicker than batters do. And as a result... Uh, chasing you'll see more teams be successful chasing as the competition pans out and that is exactly what has happened in this big bash and there are quite a few examples of him perfectly predicting wickets just before they've happened pretty sure was that, that was the most famous one yeah. but yeah, i think there's been I quite a few pre- recently the pretty sure one was funny because he'd been his coach at the, uh, at <laughs> yeah, the Delhi yeah. capital so it's like if you if you knew this was coming because you not have <laughs> said something back then <laughs> rather than now but yeah. Um, the Women's T20 World Cup is less than a month away. England announced their squad last week. Alice Capsey is there despite breaking her collarbone last month. England have said they wanted to give her every oppor- every chance of 
recovering. Izzy Wong is not in the squad. She's a reserve, as is Danny Gibson, an all-rounder who has not before played for England. Kate Cross won a recall. She's not played a T20I since 2019. There's no Tammy Beaumont and Lauren Winfield-Hill is in. Um, ben, what are your thoughts on the squad as well as England's chances? Yeah, I think the squad is is broadly as I expected to be. I, I suppose the one thing is the, the the lack of Izzy Wong and also the, the split between what four quicks, three spinners in the squad says something about what they expect conditions to be like, which is sounds not like how I described T20 cricket in South Africa <laughs> a little bit before. Like you, you'd think if, if there were pitches with a bit of juice in them, then Izzy Wong could be a really exciting prospect, but they've chosen to go another way. Uh, their prospects, I mean... I think they go into it as, as third favourites and uh, reasonably, not not distant third favourites, but there is a gap between them and, and the top two. Um, I'm really glad that Lauren Winfield-Hill is in it, despite not absolutely lighting things up on her return. I, I, there was a fear that she would come back and then she'd you know, have quite a, a, a short go in conditions that, that, that were pretty tricky for batters uh, and then would be sort of, uh, they'd be like, oh, okay, we, we, we've seen enough sort of thing. But I'm glad that she is in there because she did have such a good home summer I think there are real reasons to think that she might well have turned a corner and be kind of the player that she kind of looked like she could be at times but kind of never was consistently and I think that there are reasons that she could be um so yeah I mean England will have will have a a decent chance and they'll I think they should get the semi-finals um but with a new coach in place and uh just the which is with how good India Australia are I think anything more than that is a bit of a bonus but it's t20 cricket and anything can happen i suppose in those knockout games mm. yeah i think kate cross is a really good pick pleased to see her back in i think they missed that experience against india at the back end of, of last summer where it all got a bit wayward with the ball um it's a bit strange she hasn't played more she's become the sort of as she described herself the liam plunkett role <laughs> and the 50 over stuff just um in the middle overs but i think she's got more to offer i think ben's point's interesting in terms of the balance of the squad i wonder if it's actually more just to do with um, playing to their strengths than the mm. conditions they expect. Charlie Dean was absolutely brilliant in the Caribbean, has made herself um, undroppable. Eccleston obviously plays, and Sarah Glenn's got a great record. I think she's number two or number three in the world in T20 bowling. So I think all three of them play almost regardless of the conditions, and then it's just however you fit the rest of them in. Uh, Izzy Wong was expensive against India, and I think there's still that sense that she hasn't got the control that you probably need in, in T20. Um, and the pace, whilst it is good, it's not so electric that it makes her a kind of automatic pick on that basis. Uh, and in terms of the chances, I think they'll get to the final and lose to Australia. <laughs> save old, save old. Australia named their squad this week. Uh, Meg Lanning returns to captain them after her break from the game and Georgia Wareham is included, having done her ACL in 2021. Yeah, on that, I think that people... Not, obviously, it is great to see Meg Lanning back. That's obviously great. You know, she's she's... The, 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 maybe the preeminent batter women's cricket has ever had and so to see as much of her as possible is good from a fan's point of view if you're um, a fan of one of the other teams you might have been looking at that Australia team a little while out there were I think fitness concerns over Alyssa Healy uh, obviously if, if Meg Lanning weren't to make it and uh, so you'd be looking okay that's maybe like may, maybe they aren't that super strong Aussie but not not just that Georgia Wareham back and she's had it was an ACL in 2021 I think that she did and she they have lots of very very good leg spinners in Australia but I think they see her as the as the leader of the pack. It'll be interesting to see how they go actually between her and Alana King, who has obviously mm. emerged since then, but Warren was definitely first choice back then. And then also with Elise Perry, who is now like, there were questions over her in T20 cricket at times and, and fairly so. And it looked like Talia McGrath might have come in and taken that all rounder spot. And she has always been a player who has looked to sort of uh, improve and add more things to her game, even when she was the most complete all rounder that you know the game has ever seen basically mm. and then she goes and smashes what two 40 ball 70s against India she's got two back to back hundreds in her last two games in domestic cricket and so she is like maybe right now as good as ever with the bat and yeah it's very hard to see anyone stopping them and even more so given uh who they've been able to include in their squad mm. um moving on Australia have named a an 18 man squad for their upcoming tour of India they named four squinners four spinners Nathan Lyon, Ashton, Agar, Mitch Swepson, and the 22-year-old uncapped off-spinner Todd Murphy. Lance Morris, who is supposed to be properly fast, has been included as well. And there's a decent chance that he plays with fitness concerns over Mitchell Stark. The noises coming out of the Australia camp at the moment seem to suggest that Agar will probably start the series. Uh, maybe Swepson, uh, but 
that those two will be preferred to Murphy at the start, not because they're necessarily better than Murphy, but because they spin the ball in the opposite way to Lyon and India are likely to have a top six with five, maybe even six right-handers. Um, we're going to cover this series pretty closely once it begins. I think it's got the potential to be amazing. Uh, Joe, how, how do you see it going after the announcement of the Australia squad? Yeah, it's an interesting squad, especially the Ashton Agar, who seems likely to play from the bits I've read that they want a, a left arm spinner there. But the, you know, there are there are sort of echoes of what England have to do here. They've plucked someone who's got no record in domestic cricket. I think he's averaging fifty with the ball over the last three years, just in the hope that he can go and do something in the subcontinent. And that never fills me with a great, great amount of confidence, given the the players he'll be up against. Um, I mean, I still. I suppose Australia, I think, are in a better position to compete than they have been of late. But I still don't think they've got enough to win out there. I think Travis Head, who's been absolutely brilliant in home conditions, uh, hasn't been as good away from home and and isn't as good against spin. So I think he, I don't think we can expect him to continue his form in India. Warner's not got a great record out there. So when those pieces start to look not so solid... Mm. and the spinners you know line obviously his record is is indisputable but the, the backup spin is not is not great i think they're going to be struggling to to win more than a match out there mm. i uh yeah I, I i do agree with with quite a lot especially the ashton agar thing I, I find it quite puzzling i mean he wasn't threatening in that test at the scg i just i just if you're expecting him to out bowl india's spinners that is a huge ask and i think i would go with swepson partly because i think you have to respect what he did in Australian domestic cricket for a number of years is kind of basically he was even like had numbers that were comparable better than Nathan Nyan at times in the shield uh, and also like looking I was looking back at his first stint in the test side when they taught Pakistan and Australia and okay he had some pretty ugly figures in Pakistan when a lot of players did but there were signs of improvement I mean he took five wickets in that in the win in Sri Lanka um, and bowled some 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 really good balls and I think you know he's a leg spinner in test cricket it's going to take a bit of time and if you're going to just pick a guy for you know, a couple of series that he doesn't even play the whole of the first one uh, and then think that you've seen enough and then go to someone else, then you're going to, Australia are going to keep having this problem and they don't really win in turning conditions. That's been a problem for them for, for a long time. I think the Lion thing is is interesting because actually his record in Asia is is not great considering his stature within Australian cricket. I mean, he's got an average of 32 there. He's had uh, some very, very good performance there. We'll take a, an eight for him one test. But bowled very well in Sri Lanka, didn't he? Yeah, last year. But but he's yet to properly dominate a series in Asia, which is a quite a significant box to be unticked for a a spinner who is kind of whose numbers otherwise are up there with one of the greats of the games. And then on the on the batting, like I I I totally agree that I mean you don't think you can expect all of Warner Quadra as well. You'd, you'd bracket in there as a, as having a not great record in those sorts of conditions and head to have a a great series. But actually, I think Australia might only need one of them to have a decent series to be really competing with India because India's batting lineup is also similarly shaky in a way. I mean, uh, especially with Rishabh Pant, if he does miss the series, that's a but huge he's, blow for he's them. Definitely he's he's definitely going to miss the series, yeah. So that's, I mean, then, then you're looking at that and actually, although the names are, are big, you're thinking of, of how they've gone recently and, and where are the big runs going to come from? And so for that reason, it'll be really interesting to see what conditions they go with mm. as well. Like, do they just go with the kind of pitch we saw for the last three tests of the England series and just back themselves to to out bowl Australia, which they would, but then you've got to also out bat them. And actually looking at that, the two batters I'd expect most score runs across both sides would be Labuschagne and and Steve Smith. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, th- it's interesting with the Indian batting at the moment. So we just, in the also in the upcoming issue of the magazine, we've got our men's test 11 of 2022. And we had a 31-strong panel uh uh, people vote for their 11 uh, including you guys and no one on the 31 panel 31 strong panel picked a single Indian specialist batter across the whole year so so Pant received plenty of votes as, as a keeper bat but no Indian batter which given their resources and given the talent is quite an extraordinary stat and also the year previously our team was kind of being dominated by Indian players and certainly the vote was I think two-thirds of the votes went to Indian players so it is it's a funny place that Indian batting finds itself because mm. there is so much talent, but it's not necessarily working. The pitchers obviously have something to do with that at home. I mean, I, I'm sure they won't do it, but I just like, we'll just prepare a proper pitch and, and, you know, back yourselves to win because I, I think they would do anyway. 
Um, this isn't a groundbreaking comment, but I expect Cody to have a big series. I think I think it's time that that turned round in, in Test cricket. There's mm. enough signs in white ball cricket that he's that he's back. Um, yeah, and just quickly on Ben's point on Swepson, I absolutely. I mean, it'd be crazy not to play him. I think you know if you don't pick an up and coming leg spinner on this tour when you're basically already in the World Test Championship final, pretty much. It's almost a free hit. No one really expects them to win. Then when are you going to do it? And it's not as though Agar is such a great containing spinner that you can expect him to do that job. I mean, Agar will probably go for quite a few runs and not take wickets. Mm. And Swepson will probably go for a few and, and might take some some. Yeah, scouts. no, I do see that. I, I'd be tempted to play Murphy just for quite similar reasons as to why you'd go for, for Swepson. If it is a bit of a free hit, especially the latter half of that series, I think Murphy might be properly good. And if that's the case and he's, I mean, this is quite a good time. Played seven suppose. first class matches, I saw. It's a bit of a. Yeah. Not, not quite Rian Ahmed, and he's, but and not he's that not, far off. And he's not got a five for yet either. But. Uh, if, he's, and he's not his state's uh, first choice spinner either, is he? I think, I think he is now. I think he, he is. He's playing now. alongside John Holland. Yeah, yeah. But towards the end of the season, he was bowling a lot, lot more than Holland. I was going through his match by match numbers. He's bowling like 20 overs, going at twos, taking three for 40 quite a lot in games where the other spinners aren't really doing that much. So I think. Yeah, and in, I've seen a few highlights of him. He, he gets a proper action on the ball in a way that actually quite quite few um, finger spinners do. And but they're not keen on playing two off spinners when yeah. Ed also bowls off spin and is exactly. their backup spinner. Yeah. Oh, sorry, their sort of third choice spinner. Yeah. The, the other thing that I wonder if they'll be considering is just thinking like, well, we've got, what, three kind of all-time great quicks, one who's statistic, and then another who's statistics are absolutely incredible, and this guy is supposed to be faster than any of them. Do we just play to that strength i mean i think it probably would be a mistake but i think they will be thinking it especially when you've got mm. green as well um just to have what you, th you think okay the pitches might not suit them exactly but stark comes and hazelwood should be good enough to take wickets especially against that sort of that that, that batting line i put it no mm. um just just on your point about indian batting i think they kind of get themselves into a muddle quite a lot and they're not very good i think we can't sometimes criticize england for uh, almost putting too much investment in certain players uh, against the evidence that there might be out there. But England have a very clear idea of who they rate and what their strengths and weaknesses are. With India, I think they, they almost do just look at numbers too much almost. So like someone like Shreyas Iyer, who's obviously a good player, he's got quite a pronounced weakness against very fast bowling and short pitch bowling in particular, which you don't come against quite often in international cricket. And he scores a lot of runs in bilateral ODIs against weaker opposition, but doesn't get any against the better teams. Yet he's preferred to Sky in the ODI side when Sky had like four bad ODIs. And similarly with Test cricket, I think, you know, they've, they've backed Ayer and I, I do wonder, is he actually going to score runs against this Australia pace attack that, that you talk about? And they've got so much talent in domestic cricket, a lot of whom you think, why isn't Pretty Shaw got another go? Or um, this guy, Safra's Khan average is literally 80 off like 45 matches when you've got guys struggling. It, 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 I think it's very confused and they sometimes, um, they don't get the best out of their slightly ridiculous talent pool. Um, other news from Australia that came through this morning was that Cricket Australia have announced that they will not be fulfilling their upcoming series against Afghanistan the CA statement said, following extensive consultation with the relevant stakeholders, including the Australian government, Cricket Australia has decided that it is unable to proceed at this time with the upcoming ICC Super League three-match men's ODI series between Australia and Afghanistan scheduled in March. This decision, following, this decision follows the recent announcement by the Taliban of further restrictions on women's and girls' education and employment opportunities and their ability to access parks and gyms. The CA is committed to supporting growing the game for women and men around the world, including in Afghanistan, and will continue to engage with the Afghanistan Cricket Board in anticipation of improved conditions for women and girls in the country. Um, Joe, it's obviously very complicated, but what do you make of that decision? Very complicated, difficult one, and I've gone backwards and forwards on this ever since the Taliban seized power, really, and, and what the future of Afghanistan cricket might look like. Um, you know, you can look historically at um, the way international sport reacted to apartheid and exiled South Africa, and uh, in part as a punishment for an abhorrent, having an abhorrent regime, but also as a mechanism to actually force change uh, and... South Africa's exile from sport did play a, was a contributing factor in in the end of the apartheid regime. Um, it's different with Afghanistan. You know what's going on is is appalling, and 
you know, there's, there's no defence for it, clearly. But I'm not sure banning Afghanistan... In fact, I am sure banning Afghanistan from playing cricket, which is what this decision could potentially lead on to, is not going to do any good. It's, it's not going to cause the Taliban to change any policies. That they don't, they don't care. So, I think it's a it's a very tricky one. Whilst it's appalling and obviously needs to be, uh, you know, condemned in the strongest possible terms, I'm not sure this is the way to go about it. Um, we were debating this before the podcast, and and Ben brought up a couple of points, which I think. Uh, you know, further that really, uh, in particular, Australia's match against them in the in the T Twenty World Cup. Well, yeah. So obviously, when, so when the Taliban took over, what a couple of years ago, Afghanistan was scheduled to play a test in Australia, and then that was cancelled in supposedly in protest of the Taliban regime. That was the, the statement at the time. Since then, Australia have uh, chosen to play them in the in the T Twenty World Cup. They didn't pull out of that game, and now they have put out the CDI series. Okay, that decision to uh, you know, to increase the restrictions on what women and girls in Afghanistan can, uh, has come between those two things. But does this mean we're supposed to uh, think that Cricket Australia thought the Taliban were basically fine when they played that T20 World Cup game? Or are we supposed to think that they didn't pull out of that because that would actually have some consequences and this is something that they actually don't hugely mind missing? I don't think either... I have a poor record on playing the, the lesser nations and in inverted commas. I mean, it... England's record is not great. Let's be let's be honest, but Australia's is pretty appalling in in, in recent history. Yeah, I, d- I don't think either reading uh, covers cricket Australia in a huge amount of of glory. The other thing is, is as Joe says, is like it, what what decision is going to uh, actually increase pressure on the government? And I guess I guess neither to a huge extent. They don't seem to hugely want to be part of the global community in the way that Staff could did during the apartheid regime. I guess, uh, but the the one thing that this does do is it deprives. Uh, Afghanistan's cricketers of a platform and Afghanistan's cricketers could basically not be more opposed to uh, the actions of their government. I mean, Rashid Khan is basically the cultural face of Afghanistan on uh, on, on, on the world uh, stage and he is very vocally against them. I mean, he's constantly tweeting, what was the hashtag? Hashtag let, let Afghan girls learn. Let Afghan girls learn. And, and he's also, you know, retweeting lots of other uh, Afghanistan cricketers who are saying similar things and, and this this is going to if and if there was a global exile um this would make those sorts of statements have less impact because you know he's, he doesn't have the the same platform to say it which would be a shame i think and uh and i think that it, it is tricky but i mean the but also the taliban weren't you know voted into power it's not a democratic thing so you're you are punishing the people of a country i think for something that has been sort of foisted on them rather than something that is you know an, an, an active thing in a way i think it, it feels like it's punishing the people of a country and uh, the sports team for actions of a government that they have no control over and it won't hugely impact that government and actually the thing that would hugely impact the government would be supporting the voice of these cricketers and it also doesn't seem like there's been a dialogue between cricket australia and the afghan players before the decision's been made i mean one of the players has come out and called for a boycott by afghan cricketers of the of the bbl and those afghan cricketers have played a huge part in sort of popularizing the bbl there's been some real good news stories i mean rashid khan is is the face of the adelaide adelaide strikers basically and so it's kind of like we're happy for these afghan players to play in this competition when it kind of boosts you know the the, the bbl's profile but this other thing is 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 not okay it's it's a it is a mess basically i think Mm. yeah i'd agree with all that and i think also the Afghanistan cricket team does not have to be a representation of its regime. And actually, Australia's decision is almost doing that more than if it would be if they played them. And also, just think back in the Football World Cup when you had, uh, obviously, it's not quite the same, but Iran um, continued to play and their players made a really powerful stance. They didn't agree with what was happening back at home. And this was an opportunity. And if they engage with the players, is like, what do you want to do? Is there a, a symbol or a gesture you want to make before the game? This is a good opportunity to do it. They they. I think it's a missed opportunity, basically. Um, and there's also what's going to be talked about with when the ICC comes to make a decision is that you officially you can't be a full member nation unless you have a, a women's team alongside your men's team. Um, ben, I mean, you pointed out that... So, so there's never been an organised women's game played in Afghanistan, I think. So, you know, the ICC didn't have a problem with this until the Taliban took over. You know, that was obviously a, a significant change. Mm. But actually, in terms of women's cricket happening in the country it's not the seismic shift that maybe 
uh, mm. some people think it is because it just wasn't there in the first place. Mm. And, and this is maybe a separate point, but I think it would be nice to see full membership in the ICC separated from some of the things that it is tied to. So it, it, I think ideally Afghanistan would have been able to play test cricket while not being full members of the ICC, but that's not possible at the moment. And equally, I think Thailand have a pretty good case to be on a, an equal footing with Afghanistan in the world game because of their of the success of their women's team but they don't really have a you know a, a high quality men's team which is what what's precluding them from that so mm. Mm. um on to the Pakistan New Zealand tour uh the test series ended nil nil so Faraz Ahmed scored 100 on the final day to keep Pakistan interested after a bold Tim Southey declaration um, in the ODIs, it's one-one after two games. Nasim Shah took a five in the first game. I don't think I think no one has ever taken more ODI wickets from their first five games than Nasim Shah. Um, Devon Conway scored a hundred in the second game, which New Zealand won. Um, New Zealand are the number one ranked side in the world at the moment, while that was Pakistan's first defeat in ten games. Um, India are going well against Sri Lanka in another ODI series. Kohli scored a hundred in the first game. There's a man cad by Mohammad Shami when. She, Dustin Shanika was on 98 when the game was dead. That was retracted. Well, the appeal for that was retracted by Rohit Sharma. We're not getting into man cads oh, again. Um, I thought we were going down that road. Uh, the, the World Cup, though, is, is not that far away. And this has been a good week for assessing where teams are at and who is likely to play a part for various teams. Um, ben, I was wondering which of those four teams has impressed you the most? I mean... I think that, that they, they've all looked good. And actually, it's, it's only just in, increased the... Uh, the excitement for the World Cup. I guess I guess Sri Lanka will be disappointed. I mean, it looks like they're not really competing in that in that second ODI, and uh, they struggled at first as well. They they put a really good showing in the uh, the T Twenty series, but India look a cut above in that. When you might have said that Sri Lanka could well be you know real contenders with the you know the Silverwood Revolution, etc. Um, it, I mean, India if if Kohli is back to that uh you know pre twenty twenty Kohli at least in ODI cricket, then that is a significant advancement on where they were before because you know and he's yet to have a properly statement ODI World Cup as well where he's come in and, and dominated it and scored you know multiple hundreds that's something that is is still left for him to do and at home after the struggles of these a few years you wonder whether it's sort of uh, scripted to be that way uh, so yeah it, India looks strong but I think Pakistan also actually um, I mean that that bowling attack when everyone is fit and it's obviously a big if if that will happen at the World Cup but Nazim Shah looks exceptional. Obviously, Harris Ralph, we know how good he is, and they've still got Shaheen to come back into it. And then also Shadab's not playing this series either. So they've got actually uh three uh, four brilliant frontline bowlers there. And Nawaz under Babal's captaincy is bowling really, really he well. Was absolutely as well. brilliant. I think four yeah. for thirty eight yesterday. Yeah, and I think he's averaging less than twenty with the ball under Babal's captaincy. So he's really improved and is kind of bowling at his best right now. And then when you look at that batting on up, I mean, um, uh, what B- B- Babar is is ridiculously consistent. I think he might have passed fifty in ten of his last eleven ODIs, which is obviously absurd. Uh, they've also got, I mean, Imam Al Haq is only like a, a notch below Babar in the consistency. He's earlier in his career, but if he has, uh, if he maintains that for the World Cup, and then Fakir Zaman is a very handy ODI batter. Rizwan, you'd expect, would come good at some point. So then you've got a a top four which you can rely on to make runs and a bowling attack which you can rely on to defend par totals. So they'll be a, a real threat as well. And then New Zealand are kind of showing why they are number one in the world a little bit. I mean, these are conditions that, you know, they, they've they never played or this none of these players have played ODIs in, in, in Pakistan before. Um, and yet they are competing well in this series. I mean, Conway just, well, he either gets a duck or a hundred at the moment, which is not a bad place to be in. Uh, and yeah, I guess they also maybe might not even go into this as dark courses, possibly just as contenders, I guess mm. we'll see. Um, ben, what's your moment of the week? Uh, oh, my moment of the week is from the, the Bangladesh Premier League. which is <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Yeah, which, which has been, you know, a, a, a sort of fun tournament. There's been a few a few sort of weird things going on. Uh, did we talk on last week's show about Shakib's? No. Uh, so that, those, <laughs> those are both. It's a dull moment of the week. So obviously we know that Shakib and, and domestic umpires have a slightly strained relationship. There was a, from a couple of years ago, he was angry at an LBW decision being given not out. So proceeds to kick the stumps over and then rip them out of the ground and throw them to the ground. And then did a, did a quite a funny apology where he said, hopefully this won't happen again in future. And he, I think he was right to hedge his bets because it, it is <laughs> happening again now. Uh, there was one where there was a, a wide that wasn't called. that was It was, to be fair, quite a distance over his head. And then he sort of marches up to the umpire and is sort of gesturing like, it's up here, what what, what are you playing at sort of thing? And then Mushfika Mushfika Rahim has to sort of step in and 
put him away and get him back to his crease. And then recently, he's actually, I think it's quite clever of him to be uh, getting his tantrums at the umpires out early in a game rather than a sort of waiting for a key moment. So before the chase started in, a, in, in their most recent game, he, um, he was sort of standing on, on the boundary in his, in his flip-flops, basically, uh, just like not, not going into bat, but just shouting something at his batters and then marched onto the field to have another quite animated discussion with the umpires, I think, about whether he could switch who would take strike to start with because of a spinner bowling and wanting uh, the opposite hand to, to play. But yeah, it's a, uh, I mean, I guess in general, maybe not a good example to see uh, Shakib setting for player behaviour and that sort He's of thing. He's not going to change now though, is he? No, that's the thing. Um, yeah. I do find it interesting that he uh, does this kind of thing in the BPL, but doesn't quite do it in international cricket. So there's obviously like an element of he feels like he can do what he wants. Yeah, in, in I think he would cricket. also, in, in his defence, sort of, he would say <laughs> it's the standard of umpiring that gets him so angry yeah. in Bangladesh. At least that's what that's what he, yeah. that's what he claims. Um, I think we might need a, a weekly Shakib in the B, B, BPL <laughs> update for you, Ben. Um, I don't know when that competition ends. Um, anyway, last week, Phil audaciously asked our listeners to get in touch to ban certain words and phrases this is for very 2023. Very I said it was a dangerous thing to do at the time. And I think I've been proven right with Phil uh, being in the firing line for most of the messages that come in. It's also, can I just say, it's unfair for you to do this at the end of the podcast when we've surely said loads of these as it's been going on. Uh, well, we let, haven't let, had Phil on though, have we? Let, so. Yeah, we haven't had, exactly. Um, so some of the phrases... I don't think we say that often. They're just phrases that people don't like being said in cricket. Uh, Johnny wanted to ban matchups, not just a word matchup, matchups in general. Um, we'll, we'll put that to the Crick, Crickviz guys when they're next on. Um, Paul wanted to ban saying, you can't write that. Again, I don't think we ever say that, um, but obviously people say that quite a lot in sport. Um, Billy sent two different emails. So this is obviously on his mind quite a lot. Hi, everyone. Firstly, I have to propose... Banning referring to Butch as anything other than former England Test captain Mark Butcher. <laughs> I like that one. Um, which is good. I'd also like to ban the use of the phrase, the rhythm or feel or flow of the game. That's Phil. Uh, and also hitting through the line of the ball. As to be honest, neither mean anything. We're just told that they do. Um, yeah, what does hitting through the line of the ball mean? Well, I've always been confused as well because you get playing with or against the turn as well. And that one is supposed to be good and the other's bad. But actually playing against the turn, you'd think you'd be able to do that more with a straight bat in a way, like your... This is what this is the Ben Jones book. <laughs> yeah, is it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, it's, That's it's literally called, the headline. against the spin, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I've what? also never known what being a line bowler means. I kind of know that, what it means. So like someone like Scott Boland is a line bowler. But more often than not, they're a line bowler, aren't they? Otherwise yeah. they won't be playing professional exactly, cricket. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah I've, I've never, I've never, I've never thought that's a good description of, of what that type of bowling I've got is. one that appears on Wisdom social media accounts quite a lot. Yeah. Take a bow, just Take ban it. <laughs> just ban it. Yeah. yeah that, that's fair. Okay, that's uh, fair. One that I don't like is um, commentators referring to strokes as a, an amazing piece of improvisation <laughs> when uh, like when a batter plays a scoop shot or something. Like there is no way that is improvised. If anything, those are the least improvised strokes in the game <laughs> because they are al almost always premeditated and obviously take an absurd amount of practice to be able to do. That I mean call them innovation, that's fine, but they are not improvised no, you know, by any know, definition. They, yeah, the they know how to play them. Mm. Um, so Billy's second email was actually no. The worst one is any time an hour in a test match is described as so important. Mm. They are all important. Literally, they all matter. It's a nonsense phrase. You can listen to three consecutive tests and hear that every single hour is described as the mo most important. So it's very irritating. That's, fair. That's very fair. Um, Stephen says my suggestion would be to ban matches being called a great or terrible advert for the game. I don't think this appears on the pod, but it definitely crops up a lot on uh, BBC and Sky. I realise that the long-term future for Test Cricket is bleak, and I would love for more people to fall in love with the best format of the game. But the idea that cricket is constantly being hawked around, always longing to appeal to some broader unknown audience, can be quite irritating. Can't we just enjoy great matches on their own merit. I wouldn't expect a book review <laughs> to conclude that a new novel was a great advert for literary fiction <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> uh, it's it's, um, it's a great email. point and it really does speak to cricket's like inferiority complex. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We're so insecure. I mean, yeah. Boy, when half, anything half good half happens, we're like, oh, I hope yeah. someone watched. Yeah. <laughs> I hope someone's watching. <laughs> and, and also, good things in sport are only good because there are also bad and boring things. Like if mm. every game was exciting, nothing would be because it would take away the value 
of those like you need like a you know the the, the first Pakistan New Zealand test match was in a way a a good advert for test cricket because it made what England did so much, so much more impressive. If, if everyone was able to do that, it wouldn't be that good, you know. Um, Stephen's email continues. In a similar vein, when something amazing happens in test cricket, you often see variations of, oh, who said test cricket was boring, eh? I don't know, some arsehole probably. Who cares what they think? We understand how the game works and why cricket at its best is unbeatable, but it's daft to pretend that it's always like the most exciting part. And one final phrase, one for Phil, what other ways of, exist of scoring 100 other than strumming it? Strumming it. Sorry. Strumming um, it. We've actually privately tried to, to try to ban this ourselves uh, and failed to do so. It's very difficult, um, though, because I mean, I've been subbing Phil's work for about 15 years now, and he's been subbing mine for the same <laughs> length. So I can't even tell what were his. I end up putting them in my work. So they're just, <laughs> it's just an absolute mess, um, really. Stroke maker. Mm. Uh, Greenhorn, oh, yeah, Green. Southpaw, yeah. But I use them all now, so I can't, I can't <laughs> complain either, really. Um, S- stroke filled as well. You get to describe centuries and like what century has not been filled with strokes. Yeah. Um, one thing actually related to the adverb test cricket is when at the end of a uh, and it or when it actually often when a game has been quite boring and then gets exciting right at the end, someone will be having probably not watched much of the game. Uh, long live test cricket or something. <laughs> Uh, and it's it's like well <laughs> we're, we're, probably not watch any yeah. of it if you think that yeah I don't um, know if this is a good thing or a bad thing but I've never listened to another podcast which invites criticism so in such a kind of welcome way I, we had the give a five star review but slag off Yaz for a yeah, while which, yeah. is, which is enjoyable tell us how we're annoying it's such a you know it's quite a brave thing to put out there um, is, this, is, this, is this a great advert for cricket podcast or not <laughs> I don't know uh, and then finally uh, Joe said long time listener first time emailer but couldn't resist this one phrases to be banned calling any major ish test series marquee feels bad for this <laughs> when referring to averages always saying a tick under or a tick over Phil again bad for this <laughs> just stop other than this I love the podcast and look forward to uh, following the 2023 year with you guys well that's us told uh, I think that'll be the last time for quite a long time that we actively ask for criticism um, but I guess this is a good opportunity to point out that if you do enjoy the show and as I often say if you've got uh, 80 minutes in I'm going to guess that you, you at least don't hate it um, I do please ask you to leave a positive review either in the YouTube comments if you're watching us on YouTube or um, giving us a nice five-star review and even a comment review on the podcast app if that's where you listen to us. Anyway, that is the end of today's show. Cheers, Joe. Cheers, Ben. This has been the Wisden Cricket Weekly Podcast where we will be back next week.